with Dr. Carl Brogy. Dr. Brogy is the senior pastor of Community Bible Church of Beaufort, South Carolina. And for the next hour, he's available to answer your questions, providing biblical insight and wisdom for everyday Christian living. Our phone lines are open, and if you have a question, you may call 525-1859 locally, or outside the immediate area, call toll-free 877-924-7980. Now let's join Dr. Carl Brogy. Study and show yourself approved of God as a workman who is not ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. I welcome you this hour to the Bible line, especially our first-time listeners. You're listening to 88.7 FM. We broadcast by the grace of God at 100,000 watts, and we also have an app uh, which you can download at the App Store. Just type in the call letters WAGP. Uh, with that said, for the next hour, we will be taking people's questions. Maybe there's a particular challenge or issue in your life and you're looking for biblical counsel or a passage you're wrestling with or some aspect of ministry and evangelism and outreach and the Great Commission in your local church. If we can be of help, all you need to do, again, the 843 exchange is simply 525-1859. Our toll-free number is 877, the call letters WAGP980, or you can text us or email us here directly into the studio, and the email address is the Bible line, it's tbl at wagp.net. Well, with that said, Walter, it's good to be here three weeks from the election. Um, things are creeping up, um, so we as believers need to be in prayer. I'm sure many questions have come in, so let's go ahead and we'll get started. Yes, sir. Good morning, Pastor Carl. Our first question comes from Tyler out of Denver, Colorado, and he writes, no matter a person's view of what the unpardonable sin is, is it universally agreed by agreed to by theologians, pastors, priests, and scholars that someone could not want to become a Christian and follow Jesus, repent of all of their sins, and want to, to and want to devote their entire lives to Him and leave everything at the cross if they had already committed the unpardonable sin? The second part of the question is: Is it universally agreed upon that you can't want to be a Christian and believe in Jesus as the Messiah? if the unforgivable sin was committed and the authors of the articles just don't always add that into their interpretation explanation. I am looking for common ground based on all the interpretations of this sin in hopes to be able to say that one can always know that no matter which interpretation may be correct, they can always seek our Lord and find forgiveness. All right, so the unpardonable sin, so to speak, is addressed by Mark and Matthew. It's highlighted if you want to hear a message on that, one of a recent series I did was on the prophet Jonah, and I dealt with the unpardonable sin because Jesus spoke to those who were on the cusp of committing it, that there would be one sign given to them, the sign of Jonah, who is in the belly of the whale three days, three nights. And so in that message at the end of Jonah 2, I deal with the essence in terms of what it is. That's not your question, though. Your question and so, again, there are some people who are uncertain as to what that means, uh, the unpardonable sin, whether they've committed. I have an hour-long message on that that I think might be helpful. Your question concerns, is there any consensus in reference to those who've committed the unpardonable sin, whether or not they can come to Christ? Well, if someone has committed the unpardonable sin, they've crossed the line they cannot cross over. So... With that said, understand that God's heart is for the salvation of souls. He wishes that none should perish, but that all should come to repentance. Uh, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you'll find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. Isaiah similarly says, look, if you're thirsty, come to the water and drink. Come buy wine and milk, uh, um, without money, without cost. And that's God's invitation for salvation. It's not something people earn. It's something that is given. Likewise, again, just in the spirit of the Bible, the scripture closes. I've turned to Revelation 22. The spirit and the bride say, come, and let the one who hears say, come. Let the one who is thirsty, come. Let the one who wishes take the water of life, again, without cost, echoing what 
Isaiah himself said. So the spirit in the scripture is for people to be saved. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son. Uh, Whoever, that means anybody who will call upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And Jesus said, and we covered this just a few weeks ago um, in my series on our identification truths in Romans, Jesus said, all that the Father gives me will come to me, and the one who comes to me I will certainly not cast out. So on what basis does God give people to the Son? On the basis on how they respond to general revelation and specific revelation. And that's why three times over in the revelation given to John, we're told that God has our names written in the book of life before the foundation of the world. God is omniscient. If he didn't know who was going to be saved, he couldn't do that. But God's omniscient, but his omniscience does not change your free will. And so God gives you a free will. Now you can understand, and I think the essence of the question becomes, on what basis is our free will free? Well, it's free in the sense that God first initiates. If there's none who seeks for God, not even one, then God must take the initiative. And I would say, unlike the hyper-Calvinists, that God initiates with everyone, that the Spirit will convict the world of sin, righteousness, and judgment. God reaches his a uh, voice out from the heavens that he has created that are declaring his glory. Paul echoes the same truth in Romans 1, that men are without excuse as terms of a knowledge of God. And in Romans 2, even those who have never seen a Bible, they have, so to speak, the Bible written in their hearts and that their conscience can defend or it can accuse them. And so if a man responds to general revelation, God will give him more revelation. Sometimes specific revelation, as we call it, concerning the cross and what Jesus did is withheld because man has already made his choice. He's already suppressed what he's known to be true. And he basically says, no God. And if a man says that long enough, he can reach a point where he can't come to Christ. The unpardonable sin today is for a person, in essence, to say, no, 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 no to the Lord God, to harden your heart against what you know to be true. Uh, There is a theologian, uh, he he graduated from Princeton University, uh, Princeton Seminary, when it was still conservative back in the uh, 1800s, and he says, there's a time, I know not when, there's a place, I know not where, that marks the destiny of men to heaven or despair. And that's true. You can reach a point in your life where you have habitually hardened your heart about what God has shown you, such that in John chapter 12, when Jesus had done many, many, many miracles in the presence of uh, these Jewish leaders, he admonished them. He said, while you have the light, believe in the light that you might become sons of light. He wanted them to be converted And yet the scripture says, though he had performed so many signs or miracles before them, they were not believing in him. And he said, this is what was predicted by Isaiah the prophet. For this reason, they could not believe. And so, yes, you can reach a point where you cannot believe because you will not believe. You cannot believe. And certainly someone who has said no to the spirit of truth, which is basically calling him a liar, which is basically a form of blasphemy against him. If you do that long enough, your time expires because you don't come to the Lord all by yourself. Now, unlike the Calvinists who would say there's two women side by side, both pregnant, uh, they would argue that both are incapable of coming to Christ. So God elects one, or he might even elect the other for damnation, whether or not you believe in a dual election. But his point is, is that God does not give people an equal chance, that there are some children from conception that are incapable of ever coming to faith in Christ. And they would say that's just because none of us deserve it. And I would say that's a slander on the character of God, uh, that people are in essence given equal opportunity. When God says, I desire all men to be saved, he doesn't mean all kinds of men. When he says that he wishes for none to perish, but for all to come to repentance, he means what he said. He said what he meant. So Calvin was an anti-Semite. He had a slanted view of Israel. It flavored his view of election. 
he dealt with Romans 9, principally different as people in the Reformed faith do uh, in terms of uh, how they view the people of Israel and therefore how they define election. So, Tyler, it's a good question. This brother writing from Denver, Colorado, and I would say to you, yes, there's, I think, a sense of agreement. You'll never get 100% agreement on any subject, but there is a sense of agreement that if a person has committed a sin by hardening his heart, some would call it blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Some, as you, uh, through your study, I'm sure note, would say that blasphemy of the Holy Spirit can't be committed today because it was unique to Christ being physically present on the earth. In either case, a person can reach a point in their spiritual journey, and it's known to God only, and you should never make a judgment call. We would have thought maybe Paul had reached that point because he not only uh, hated Christ, he persecuted Christians and was involved in the first martyr's death, Stephen. Uh, he, he, in most folks' mind, had reached a point where he couldn't cross back over, but God showed him mercy. The thief on the cross with the other thief both blasphemed Jesus together. They cursed him. The Greek word is blasphemeo, but one had a change of heart. Now, that's not the pattern, a deathbed conversion. We often say there's only one deathbed conversion in all the Bible, one so that none will despair, but none so that none will presume. And so only God knows those who have crossed the line. But Jesus spoke of the fact that some who are on rocky soil, and the rocky soil basically represents a stony heart. Uh, When you hear the message of salvation, don't harden your heart. And if you harden your heart habitually to the revelation God has given you on whatever level it is given to you, you can reach a point where you cross a line known only to God that you cannot cross over. There is a line by us not seen, which crosses every path, the hidden boundary between God's mercy and God's wrath, as Joseph Alexander wrote in the 1800s. So we are to share the gospel. We do not know those individuals who are on rocky soil such that Jesus can say Satan is given permission to snatch the seed that they may not believe and be saved. Our responsibility is not to make that assessment. God alone can make it. Our responsibility is to be faithful and to share the gospel. Good question. Let's go on to the next. 843-525-1859 if you have a question for Pastor Carl this morning. Our next question comes via live dictation from Claire out of Beaufort, uh, South Carolina, and she writes, I see a lot of political signs around Beaufort, and I would like to know Dr. Brogy's thoughts on Shelley Yuha. If you've heard of her, Pastor Carl. Yeah, I actually have heard of her. I've actually met her. She is definitely a born-again believer who knows and loves Christ and not ashamed of him. And so, you know, as Christians, we have a responsibility to, to vote for righteousness. The Bible says in Proverbs that I've just turned to, Proverbs 14, 34, righteousness exalts a nation but sin is a reproach to any people. So actually, she would represent me in my district, District 121. She's running for a state house seat. And let me just say parenthetically, state politics are very, very important. In some ways, they have a greater influence on what your life is going to be like than the federal government, because we do live in a republic, and there are what we call states' rights. And so there are certain states in which we are, quote-unquote, freer in terms of the biblical Judeo-Christian ethic than in other states, in some states that cling more closely to the Constitution of the United States than, than others do. I was speaking to a young man yesterday, and he's thinking about going to Clemson, and I just reminded him, it's extremely woke. I'm not saying you shouldn't go there. I had a daughter who went there. But they are woke, and they're socialists in terms of the curriculum that they're teaching young people. One of our students was asked to basically step down. In fact, she was basically fired from being a residential mentor for the simple reason that she refused to use preferred pronouns. So she calls me, and we call Alliance Defending Freedom, and they represent her, and Clemson was found in violation of her religious rights. Now, I would have liked to have seen that become a national issue. It did not. 
But nonetheless, um, what they're doing now, they're very slick. They're just going to check your Facebook page, your social media, the groups on campus that you're engaged in. And if you're an evangelical born-again Christian, they're just not going to choose you to be a residential mentor, which is religious prejudice, and they can hide it and cover it and say, well, this person was not as qualified as the one we selected. That's where it's all headed. Not to mention they fought the Constitution tooth and nail. But I'm not a political commentator. God hasn't called me to do that. He has called me to preach the Word of God. And whenever the Word of God uh, intersects with political issues, then we have a responsibility. So Michael Rivers is a Democrat. Shelley Gay Uhas is a Republican. Now, there's a lot of Republicans in the State House who are rhinos who really aren't Republican, but she is. But let me just make some broad comments. I could not vote for a party that pursues death through the murder of innocent babies. That kind of party is Satan-inspired. Listen, we have divine commentary on Herod, who was involved in the murder of little babies in Matthew chapter 2. And in Revelation, the 12th chapter, God pulls the curtain back and shows us what was happening in the spiritual realm and that the evil one, Satan himself, was behind the destruction of these little children. And Satan himself is behind the destruction of the murder of innocent babies in the womb. And that's what it is. And so a vote for a Democrat is to um, affirm things that God himself hates. God hates this, what is happening. And when I called my representative, Michael Rivers, concerning the heartbeat, all I got was a lot of grief. And now he's a quote-unquote reverend, but there's a lot of fake reverends. Listen, when, when my state senator, when I call him because he ran a committee that on three occasions blocked a bill from getting out on the floor— so that it could be voted on to protect life in the womb. I call him and his secretary tell him he's pro-life. I said, he's not. He, he's, he's stopping this bill. Finally, I get him and I spend nearly a half an hour on the phone with him, pleading with him. He's a pastor up in Charleston. He's a pastor. And basically he tells me, look, I, I am personally against abortion. And this is the common line people use but it's a woman's right to make her choice. No, it's not. It's not my right to murder a two-year-old next door. That's not my right. That's against God's moral law, and it's not my right to exterminate a baby in the womb because God's Word teaches that life begins at conception. And I said, look, you're either lost, which is what I suspect, or if you know the Lord, you are going to come under the severe discipline of God. Two weeks later, some young man tragically walked into that church during a Wednesday night Bible study, and they shot him and eight other people. What a tragedy of tragedies that it happened. But listen, just because a man is a reverend doesn't mean that he espouses to biblical values. And certainly he gave me nothing but grief when I called him as my representative. So I'm not going to support a party that is in favor of the death of innocent babies in the womb. And on top of that, they're in favor of the mutilation of little children's bodies. Look, 20 years ago, this would be considered child abuse. How can you support that kind of abuse to little children? That's what the Democratic Party stands for. It's the most radical party in our nation's history in terms of their platform. And I don't see how a Christian who's trying to walk with God and please God could vote for a party that espouses things that God absolutely hates. He said it would be better for a large millstone. The word is used of a millstone that a donkey pulls, not the kind of millstone a woman might use in her home to grind her flour. But a large millstone, better to have that hung around a person's neck than to hurt a little child. And abortion hurts little children and the mutilation of little children and giving them drugs to supposedly change their uh, gender is wickedness. You know, we have a responsibility to vote for a party that best stems the tide of evil. And I recognize there are no perfect candidates. And even in the presidential realm, both are broken, both are lost, as best I can tell. But certainly one presents a far greater and better option for the upholding of life 
and the protection of the family than the other. And so you don't have to like the personality of a person to vote for the person. You want the person whose politics best reflects what God's word says. And one is certainly far better than the other. And I think that's true on this state level. Now, my son and I, my son is really familiar with just about every single candidate uh, in the or in the Senate or in the House and those who represent us, because for seven years he worked to have a three-hour bill passed that would require students in South Carolina to learn the Constitution, the Federalist Papers, the Declaration of Independence, and the Emancipation Proclamation. Who opposed him? Leaders, administrators, high ups in uh, at Clemson, at USC. Again, these are socialist institutions. Why would they not want the Constitution taught? They have a three-hour course on uh, Lady Gaga, another course on tailgating 101, but they can't do this in terms of um, helping students to understand our Constitution and bylaws. Uh, uh, I forgot what the number was. I think it was 40% of college graduates think that Judge Judy is on the Supreme Court of the United States. I mean, people don't know what our country stands for. So we are to vote. The word vote vote is from the Latin votem, that means to make a choice, and we're called to make a choice. I'm turning now to Matthew chapter 5, and I'm thinking about what Jesus said over there. Uh, He admonishes us, you are the light of the world, a city on a hill cannot be hidden, nor does anyone light a lamp and put it under a basket, but on the lampstand, and it gives light to all who are in the house. Let your light shine before men in such a way that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven." That's what my son Jameson was trying to do, to be salt and light. And by God's grace, the bill passed, and the governor invited him in and for the signing and handed him the pen because he wrote the bill that uh, his senator uh, sponsored, and, and it was passed by the grace of God. And now 23,000 students a year in South Carolina have to study the Declaration. Look, you know who opposed him? Some of these liberal Democrats. They fought it tooth and nail. And so a failure to vote and make a choice is a failure to be salt and light. It's a failure to uphold God's righteous standards. And look, take all the air out of the balloon. If, um, if Trump, for the sake of argument, loses, and I hope he doesn't, I pray he doesn't, if he loses, evil is going to spread all that much faster. If he wins, I think it might slow down the spread of evil, but don't be deceived to think that this is going to last long because what is happening in our nation is that righteousness is not exalting a nation because we have fewer and fewer righteous people. And our responsibility as Christians is to spread the gospel. And when that stops, then our light is diminished. The salt is no longer preserving righteousness and evil spreads. And it's just a matter of time before the next generation will fully espouse to the policies of the Democrat Party. And God has called us not to live in some stained glass prison. He's called our, (laughs) excuse me, voices to be heard. People say, well, politics are dirty. Well, germs are dirty, but doctors are not called to stay out of hospitals And we, as God's people, the things that are Caesar's, we're to render to Caesar's. And our government is a republic by which um, we represent God's values. It's a government for the people, by the people. And if you do not vote, then you're not rendering to Caesar's that which is yours. And one of the great scandals of our time are evangelicals who aren't even registered to vote. And it's very, very, very sad. And so I'm not here to comment on the specifics between the differences. But if you're asking me who I would vote for, I would certainly not vote for a Democrat. So when I speak to my son, and I'll bring this in for a landing, he said, from a practical point of view, Shelley Uhas doesn't stand a chance because this is a democratically entrenched region. And sadly, by a lot of African Americans who are either voting blindly or they're voting disobediently uh, because some are lost. And so, yeah, he's a Democrat. We've got to vote for this black representative. That, that's not how you vote for people, whether they're black or white. 
we've got a senator over here representing Bluffton Hilton Head. I, I wouldn't spit at him. He's white and, um, you know, I, I wouldn't do anything to support him. Why? Because he's a, he, re- he rejects the gospel of Jesus Christ. But Christians, he's a rhino, he's a Republican, they're voting for him nonetheless. It's not an issue of Republican versus Democrat, black versus white. So I admire this lady for running because she knows that from a human perspective, it's impossible. It's impossible from a human perspective. But that's not how we measure obedience. We measure obedience by doing what's right. And maybe there's enough people listening who still have a a spine of righteousness who will defend for what's right and step out of tradition and do uh, the best thing. And the, and, and, and so I'm voting for Shelly to answer your question. Anyway, let's go to the next one. That's a a little, um, we have a live caller. I think that's waiting. Yes, sir. Let's go ahead. 843-525-1859. If you have a question for Pastor Carl on this morning's Bible line, we are going to go to the phone lines, Pastor Carl. I believe we have Daniel out of Bluffton, South Carolina. Good morning, Daniel. You are live with Pastor Carl. What is your question? Hey, Pastor Bergie. I hope you both are doing well. Thank you for taking my call. Um, my question was, I've been reading uh, Matthew a lot, and I'm in Chapter 7 currently, and I was reading those first couple verses. And in it, it was talking about how Jesus was saying, asking you shall receive, and seeking you shall find. Um, and at this point in my life, I'm trying to kind of figure out what I'm supposed to do with my life. And so that kind of hits, hits home for me, but it's also hard because, um, I know there are expectations that are unrealistic, um, as far as when asking God for things, like you can ask him for like a million dollars and then expect it or whatever, if you know what I mean. Yes. Yes. Um, but my question is like, how does that relate to Christians and how do you know, because I kind of view it as how Gideon um, heard from God, which is kind of different because he, you know, God spoke to him directly, but he said, hey, if I'm going to put this fleece out, and if you want me to do it, just, you know, make it wet. And he and he was faithful in that. But as far as today, today's day and age, how do you, I guess my question is how do you tell when God's speaking to you and, like, giving you what you asked for or trying to keep you away from something? Yeah, no, that's a great question. So let me see if I can respond, Daniel. Obviously, God answers prayer that is in accordance with his will. So that's the starting point. And I know you know that, but maybe not everyone here has thought about that. Uh, I wouldn't, you know, pray for some candidate that wants to kill little babies in the womb. Obviously, that would be a prayer against the will of God to go back to our last question. So if you're heart is to please the Lord, you know, that that's, that's the most important thing. So there's God's general will, and if we know that we are in line with God's general will, what is clearly revealed in Scripture, and that's um, sadly not a given in our day, because there are a lot of believers who are compromised. There are believers who are compromised in their viewing habits. They're watching television shows and movies and of visiting internet websites that are morally despicable to the living God. They're filled with sensuality and idolatry. And obviously, if they're walking and trafficking in evil, then their heart is not in sync with the Lord. So all things being equal, I'm a spirit-filled Christian, which means I'm not grieving him. There's no unconfessed sin in my life. I'm not quenching him. I'm available to do whatever he wants me to do in the positive realm. So some Christians are not in known sin, but they're unwilling to, um, in the positive realm, to obey the Lord. And that's where quenching the Spirit comes in. Uh, We're depending on Him, walk by the Spirit, a third command in Scripture. We depend upon the Holy Spirit as a man depends on air to survive. And so a person who's doing that, his day starts in prayer, more than likely I'm not a legalist here, but the pattern is he's in the Word of God each day because, again, the parallel is not um, by accident when Colossians 3 tells us to let the Word of God richly dwell within us. That's the main verb, and then there's a series of participles that follow that give the um, results of someone who is letting God's Word richly fill their hearts. And then the parallel passage is in Ephesians 5, don't be drunk on wine, but be 
fill with the Spirit. That's the main verb. And then there's a series of participles that get their strength from the verb. That is, these are the marks of someone who is Spirit-filled or letting God's Word richly dwell within them. And in Colossians 3, in what follows... Uh, 15 and 16, and Ephesians 5, 18 and 19, and what follows, all the way into the next two chapters, they're identical. They're identical. So if I want to find the will of God when I'm with him in prayer, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of the heart. And a new covenant aspect of delighting in the Lord is I'm a spirit-filled Christian. And if someone's listening to me today and they're not sure what that means, I would direct you to my basic discipleship course. And I have, that's available at searchthescriptures.org. We teach it on Sunday mornings at Community Bible Church under the banner, the Discovery Class. And I think it's like 35-page handout on what it means to be a Spirit-filled Christian. And so this is foundational to answered prayer. Because if I regard iniquity in my heart, for instance, the Lord does not hear, that's a uh, verse, Psalm 66, 18, that's not written to the lost, but to the saved, of why God sometimes does not hear the prayer of a saved person. Uh, The Bible says in the book of James, the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man avails much. And so he is speaking not of positional righteousness, that's a given, James is dealing with practical or sanctificational righteousness. That is, when you get saved, you are credited with the righteousness of Christ. That's the imputation of righteousness. God not only wipes the slate clean, he credits you with the righteousness of Christ. But then there's practical righteousness where I'm walking in fellowship with the Lord. So the Bible makes a clear distinction between our union and our communion, between our relationship with God and our fellowship with God. First John 1, 9 is a fellowship verse that has nothing to do with salvation. So the effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man, he's dealing there with practical righteousness, having just illustrated with Elijah. And so Elijah fervently prayed, and that's what this verse is really dealing with. It's a form of fervent prayer ask, and if you have the New American Standard, which to me is like the uh, a premier translation, if there's a issue going on in the Greek text, it will footnote it, and so it will say, keep asking. And then it will note, keep seeking, or keep knocking. So keep asking, and it will be given to you. Keep seeking, and you will find. Keep knocking, and it will be opened to you. And so this is fervent prayer. This is not giving up. And so that's what you do. And so until God removes that desire from your heart, again, delight yourself in the Lord and he'll give you the desires of your heart. You may be praying for something that is big and bold and beyond belief in that people would say, well, that could never happen. Well, that's what you pray for and let God slam the door shut where he either definitively says no, or he has shown you, you need to pursue something else. And so there is an experiential side to the Christian faith and to the leadership of the Spirit, but of course it never contradicts, uh, the will of God never contradicts the Word of God. And so if the Spirit of God is leading me, it's always going to be in conjunction with His Word. He always leads in conjunction with the Word of God. He never contradicts what He has inspired in this book. And so that's kind of a starting place. And again, you know, like a child, Samuel, um, you know, goes before the Lord and he is like a little child. And that's what God honors. You know, Lord, I don't know if this is your will, but I'm here on my knees in your presence. And this is what I think I need. But if you want to slam the door shut, I invite you to do that. But until you do that, I'm going to keep seeking you on this. And sometimes it's what seemingly is impossible, but that's what you do. And you seek the Lord on that until he otherwise takes that desire from your heart. But again, this can only happen in the context of a spirit-filled life. And if I'm not spirit-filled, then I'm not going to be that sensitive uh, to God's will. And even when I don't know how to pray as I ought, as we just covered in a recent message, Uh, God the Holy Spirit translates our prayer according to the will of God. 
And so he has a way. So you're praying that you can marry Susie. And oh, I really think I need to marry Susie. And you need to make her like me. And then and the Spirit of God takes that request and says, so it's not really Susie that he needs, Lord Jesus. It's, it, it's, a, it's a so-and-so. And God translates that prayer. And all of a sudden, Susie's engaged to someone else. And you say, well, that door's shut. And so-and-so now loves you. And you love her. And and you thought Susie was the ideal choice when in reality she was not the best choice for you. So God has a way of doing that as we pray in the Spirit, and that's what we're commanded to do, to pray in the Spirit. Uh, I have to be a Spirit-filled individual, and then I see the double intercessory ministry of the Spirit in Christ who are, who are at work. So listen to that recent sermon. It's back three weeks back. Uh, at uh, communitybiblechurch.us. Anyway, good question. Let's go to the next. All right, Pastor Carl, 843-525-1859. Again, that is 843-525-1859 if you have a question for Pastor Carl this morning. Our next question comes in via live dictation from Marsha out of Bluffton, South Carolina, and she writes, what is the difference between how the Catholic Church presents the Eucharist and how a born-again believer partakes of communion? Well, uh, obviously, there's a huge difference. Um, evangelical born-again Christians typically believe in what's called an ordinance. I know some evangelicals use the term sacrament, and typically when the word sacrament is used, just by virtue of the nature of the Latin word, uh, there's more than simply a symbol that's involved. And so there are some groups that teach that at the Lord's table— or the table of the Lord, uh, or the Lord's Supper, that there's some kind of grace that's infused uh, for the believer to strengthen the believer. And I would say that, well, that's only true in the sense that whenever we obey God, we're availing ourselves to the grace of God, whether it's in evangelism or studying the Bible or whatever it might be. But to say that this is some like supernatural means of grace, I think goes beyond the testimony of Scripture. So most of the Protestant reformers taught what's called an ordinance, that the Lord's Supper is a symbol. It's a very, very important symbol that we are to remember because every time we come to the Lord's table, we are acknowledging that we've been bought with a price. We're acknowledging not only the price that has been paid so that we're not our own and we're to live for the glory of God, but at the Lord's Supper, we're also acknowledging that he is coming again. We do this, we proclaim this until he comes again. And we are recognizing that no matter how desperate the world may look or how evil it may grow, our hope is not here. We're aliens and strangers. It doesn't mean that we don't try to impact our world around us, but this is not our real home. Our home is in heaven, and that's what we're looking forward to. Now, in Catholicism, they teach what's called transubstantiation. Uh, they don't say it's a symbol. Trans means a change of substance, transubstantiation. And they argue that a point in the Mass when the priest holds up the Eucharist, and when I was an altar boy and he held up the Eucharist, I would ring the bells, because that's when you were supposed to ring the bells. And churches that typically have bells and smells go way beyond the uh, truth of Scripture. And at a high Mass, they'd bring out the incense and it, all this hoopla that had nothing to do with anything in terms of what the Bible reveals. But when he holds up that Eucharist, they argue that that host is literally changed into the body and blood of Christ. They speak of the ubiquitous presence of Christ, that it's a miracle. It's a miracle that when you put that host in your mouth that is typically treated with wine, so that you're getting quote-unquote both, that the substance is changed, though it retains the same taste, flavor, and smell of a natural object. That's not a miracle. A miracle, biblically defined, is when God takes the natural laws, if I can use that term, that he wrote into the universe— and he goes against the very laws that he wrote into the universe so that Christ walks on the water. God splits the Red Sea in two. Those are laws that go beyond the laws, the physical laws that God wrote into the physical universe. So Catholicism, of course, too, bases in the, that, that in the Lord's Supper 
which again, they call the Eucharist. And this is not always true, but I would say as a general rule, and there's only two terms given in the Bible for what we call communion, the Lord's table and the supper of the Lord. And those are the only two terms that you find in the New Testament. And so not always, but typically when it's called something else like the Eucharist, now, eucharisteo is the Greek word that means to give thanks, and there's nothing wrong with giving thanks, and we should give thanks when we come to the Lord's table. But typically, when terms beyond the two that are given in the Scripture are used, there's more meaning that is infused to the, into this table than what Scripture actually tells us. So they take a verse from John chapter 6, grossly out of context, and... Um, where Jesus speaks of his body and blood, and unless you eat the body and blood of the Son of Man. Look, he was not propagating cannibalism. He's not going against the Torah. He already affirmed that he didn't come to disobey the law, but to keep it. And so he's not breaking the law by asking people to do something that Scripture definitively speaks against. And if that was literally transformed into his body and blood, then indeed that would be a misrepresented misrepresentation of what God has revealed in other passages of Scripture. But he says, he who eats my flesh and drinks my blood, I'm reading John 6, um, has eternal life, and I will raise him up on the last day. For my flesh is true food, and my blood is true drink. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood abides in me, and I in him. As the living Father sent me, and as I live because of the Father, so he who eats me, he also will live because of me. This is the bread that came down out of heaven, not as their fathers ate and died. He who eats this bread will live forever. And of course, he's speaking in Capernaum. And so many of the disciples, when they heard this, they said, Lord, this is a difficult statement. Who can listen to it? But Jesus, conscious that his disciples grumbled at this, said to them, does this cause you to stumble? What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit who gives life. The flesh profits nothing. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and are life. But there are some who do not believe. His point is not literally eating of his flesh and drinking of his blood, but being so identified with him through genuine faith. And that's what he is affirming all the way through this sixth chapter, that you must believe in him. I am the bread of life. This is the bread of life discourse that had, uh, was given the day after he performed the miracle on the other side of the sea. And so they come back to Capernaum, to the synagogue there, and he gives the bread of life discourse that's uniquely uh, recorded in John's gospel. And when you read through the gospel of John, If indeed communion was necessary to salvation, literally eating of the body and blood of Christ, and he's contradicting himself all the way through this gospel. And by the way, this, again, discourse is only recorded in John's gospel. So you don't want to infuse into the Lord's table more that is written there. If this person wants to do a deep dive study, I would direct you to my course on ecclesiology. That's at searchthescriptures.org. We have what there, what we call the Institute of Biblical Studies, And one of the courses is on the doctrine of the church, and we look at what the Bible says about the Lord's Supper, what it says about baptism, and so forth. Um, So anyway, I hope that helps and gets you started in thinking a little bit. Let's go on to the next question. 843-525-1859 if you have a question for this morning's Bible line. Our next question comes in as anonymous out of Hilton Head, South Carolina, and they write, I am a new believer and learning a lot. A friend of mine recently sent me a video where it explains why believers should not worship on Sunday, but that they should do it on the Sabbath. What does Dr. Brogy think? I think your friend sent you a video that distorts the clear teaching of the Word of God. And so the Scripture teaches that the Sabbath is not Sunday. The Sabbath is the first day of the week. That was the day in which God's people worshiped on the Lord's day. The Sabbath was Saturday. We worship in light of the Lord of the Sabbath, not on the first day of the week, but we worship, excuse me, not on the last day of the week, but on the first day of the week. So your friend obviously is probably a Seventh-day Adventist. And of course, they teach this gross error. Ellen G. White taught a lot of gross error 
And, you know, sometimes you need to just consider the source. And so when you have, you know, a lady that was so twisted in her theology, why would you want to listen to her? Uh, you, you don't want to. Um, and so she was the one who propagated this idea that we should worship on the seventh day of the week. And they actually made it a test of salvation. Uh, they made it a test of, um, you know, a true believer. And so their whole denomination is built on the Sabbath. But understand that the Decalogue has never changed. Sometimes the application of the Decalogue has changed. The Decalogue meaning, of course, the Ten Commandments. For instance, the Bible says, Obey your father and mother. This is the first commandment with a promise that it might be well with you and that you might live long on the land. Uh, There was a specific time-bound command in the sense that it dealt with the nation of Israel when they were living in the land of Israel. Uh, Today, under the New Covenant, Paul quotes the same commandment in Ephesians chapter 6, and he says that you may live long on the earth. Why? Because God is at this point, during this economy, during this administration, during this dispensation, is working with the church that's an international body that is found all over the world. And so the scripture is clear that it's not that you might live in the land of Israel, but that you might live on the earth, wherever that may be. So I say all this to say that the first day of the week is established as the day in which we should worship. That's the New Testament, uh, the New Testament testimony. That's the clear testimony of Scripture. In fact, uh, there's coming a day in the future when we won't worship on Sunday. It's called the Millennial Reign of the Messiah, and the Lord God will have us worshiping again on the seventh day of the week. But right now, while God has not changed, uh, the one who is the same yesterday, today, and forever, sometimes the way he deals with his people has, has changed. So when you come into the New Testament, it's very clear that the church didn't worship on the seventh day, but on the first day of the week. Now, they'll take a few isolated passages where the apostles go into a synagogue on the seventh day. Why do they do that? Because they're called to take the gospel to the Jew first and then to the Greek. That's what the scripture teaches. And so they're being all things to all men. They're going to those who fear God, and they're trying to win them to the Messiah. Where are you going to find them? In the synagogue on the seventh day. But the church didn't meet on the seventh day. They met on the first day, Acts 20, verse 7, on the first day of the week when we're gathered together to break bread. Now, they'll argue probably in your film that this is some doctrine the Roman Catholic Church invented. That's just stupid. That's not even accurate, not even close to being accurate. This is a a doctrine that the New Testament establishes. Paul in 1 Corinthians 16 says, on the first day of every week, each one of you is to put aside and save. He's talking about collecting funds on the first day of the week. Every time Christ meets with his disciples that is recorded in the New Testament, interestingly, it's on the first day of the week. A sermon that I would suggest maybe that would be helpful to you is download the Search the Scriptures app and um, type in Genesis, and you'll want to listen to the sermon Genesis 2, 1 through 3, where I walk through a number of evidences that demonstrate we worship not on the seventh day, but the first day. The Sabbath is a mere shadow. The substance belongs to Christ, Colossians 2 reminds us. So anyway, I hope that helps. That's a short answer, but I have an hour-long message on this. But your friend has given you some gross error, and you might even ask your friend the diagnostic questions Let me ask you a question. How sure are you, if you were to die right now, that you'd go to heaven? Seventh-day Adventists, by the way, teach that you can lose your salvation. That's gross error. Seventh-day Adventists Adventists teach that people who go to hell are annihilated there. That is, they're burned up and they cease to exist, that it's not an eternal place of retribution. Seventh-day Adventists... um, teach that when you die as a believer, your body, soul, and spirit sleep in the grave. No, the Bible teaches only the body is sleeping, absent from the body, present with the Lord. Seventh-day Adventists teach that we should obey the 
dietary laws of the Old Testament. No, Jesus, Mark 7, 17, declared all meats clean. It's just error after error after error propagated by this lunatic Ellen G. White, who even taught that Jesus had a sin nature, but just never sinned. I mean, that's heresy. Now, in fairness to some Adventists, they have rejected that particular doctrine of Ellen G. White, but all the others that I just stated, they affirm, they teach, along with Sabbath day worship, and we don't worship on the Sabbath. And so it's actually incorrect when someone prays on the Lord's Day on Sunday, they say, Lord, thank you for this Sabbath day in which to worship. No, it's not the Sabbath day. We're worshiping on the first day of the week because that's the pattern that God gave us in the New Testament. Anyway, good question. Let's go on to the next. I believe we have time for one more, Pastor Carl. It's from Mindy out of Beaufort, and she writes, At the end of a sermon on September 15, 2024, you said that there were two Baptist churches here in town that, there be- that believe there are mistakes in the Bible. Can you please tell me which two churches you are referring to? You can ask me off the air, and I'll be happy to tell you because I'll just, uh, I won't accomplish anything by giving in on the air. But listen, any church, here's, here's the clue, any church that is cooperative Baptist or dual aligned, Southern Baptist slash cooperative Baptist, cooperative Baptists were fundamentally started on the premise, on the premise that there are errors and mistakes in the Bible. Cecil Sherman was the founder of the Cooperative Baptist. I can remember him. I can still see him on Nightline, a show that's been off the air for a few decades, I think, holding the Bible and waving it in the face of W.A. Criswell, who was the pastor at the time at First Baptist Church of Dallas, saying there's all kinds of mistakes and errors in this book. That's the fundamental premise in which they started on. That's why they're egalitarian. That's why they have women preachers. That's why they send students in South Carolina to the Lutheran Theological Seminary in Columbia that is a wicked seminary affirming LGBTQIA rights. It's gross error. That's why one of these cooperative Baptist churches recently removed that marriage is between a man and a woman. They didn't say marriage can be Uh, on the gay level, but that's the first step. They did not want to offend people. Look, if you have a Bible that's not infallible and inerrant, that has errors in it, then you have to discern what's true and what's not. As you've heard me say many times, if the Bible is inspired in spots, then you have to be inspired to spot the spots. And that's why any church that's cooperative Baptist, they're part of a wicked, fallen, depraved, organization, and you should run a thousand miles an hour away from those churches. Uh, That's what I would say to you. Look, if a pastor does not believe that every single word in the Holy Scripture is the inspired, infallible, inerrant Word of God, then you're in a crummy church, and you should get out. Well, uh, let me just share a couple thoughts here as we close our time off later today. At 4.30, I'm going to be speaking over in Hilton Head. So if you're listening in Hilton Head to a group called Friends of Liberty, uh, they'll be meeting, I'm told here, at Shelter Cove Veterans Memorial, which is 59 Shelter Cove Lane in Hilton Head. So I'll be there at uh, 4.30. They've asked me to come and speak on the subject of, um, not politics per se, but how do we discern the mess that our country is in and how do we as um, Christians, and I think there's a lot of people who would not call themselves Christians who are a member of this group as well. So you can pray for me uh, for that. If you don't have a place to go tomorrow night, we have one of our premier ministries. We, um, by God's grace, have some 400 missionaries, two of whom are Terry and Lisa Brown, who serve in the Czech Republic for the last 25 years. That's a very difficult nation in which to serve, and he'll be speaking tomorrow evening at our Wednesday night service at 6.30. I invite you out for that. There's children's choirs for the kids during the same time. So would encourage you to come and be a part of that. Anyway, our next Meet the Pastor, if you're without a church home, will be on uh, the 27th of October at 5.30, And that is an opportunity for people who are looking for a church home to get their questions answered. And if you're not 100% sure that if you died today that you'd go to heaven, I would definitely encourage you to come because I'll share 
how you can have that certainty. Well, we're out of time today. Thanks for joining us as we have been answering questions. If you have further questions, you can go to uh, searchthescriptures.org, and there's a drop-down schedule. Ask Dr. Berge a question. We'll do our best to respond. God bless you as you walk with Christ. <music>